A hand time. A cutesy 3D platformer created as a love letter to Nintendo 64 era classics such as Bandit Kazooie, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and Mario 64. But how did this great game come to be? How did it go from this to the masterpiece it is today? And what pieces were lost along the way? Welcome to the hand time documentary that nobody asked for. Today is August of 2012, and the creator of a hand in time, Jonas Karlov, is messing around with the Unreal Development Kit, a free tool that made the technologies of Unreal Engine free more accessible to the public. Now, Jonas Karlov has worked in the games industry before, making a variety of mods, mostly for Team Fortress 2, along with other side projects. While he was messing around with the Unreal Development Kit, he began making a platformer. This platformer quickly expanded into a bigger and bigger game as Jonas continued to mess around with it in his free time. Soon it became so big that he needed to bring more people on to help with the development of the game. But there was one small problem. One that the team had a much harder time solving. Funding. Turns out working on games for long periods of time with no funding is not very profitable. At first Jonas asked publishers if any of them would be willing to help with funding for the game, but they got turned down. So there was only one other place they could go. Kickstarter. And that Kickstarter would be their golden ticket to making one of the most beloved indie games of all time. On May 29th, 2013, the A of them created a Kickstarter and immediately found great success. 12 hours in, and they had already reached over 50% of their goal. Although they admittedly didn't ask for much. Uh, only around $30,000, which they reached the very next day. Luckily, they still had around $100,000 left to go until they reached all their stress goals. But those goals didn't last long either. In five days, they had already funded a developer commentary, a co-op mode, and an extra chapter. At this point, the team had to make even more stretch goals as they had vastly underestimated how many people would fall in love with the idea. Their incredible success gained the attention of Grant Kirkhope, a great musician who has made tracks for Banjo-Kazooie and Donkey Kong 64, just to name a few. Grant Kirkhope agreed to make a song for the Hat in Time if they had reached all their current stretch goals. And it's worth mentioning that the game at this point is quite a bit different from the Hat in Time many of us know today. A lot of characters, plot lines, and worlds were changed or removed during development. For example, today the story of a Hat in Time goes like this. Hat Kid's returning home on her spaceship and gets held up by the Space Mafia. Space Mafia try and collect tax. Mean Hat Kid, set door on Mafia. Mafia break door. Timepieces fly everywhere, and Hat Kid needs to collect them to get back home. But back then, the plot was the very fabric of time is falling apart. The intimacy of time has been kidnapped by Mustache Girl. The world as we know it is ending, and we're all doomed. As you can see, this is vastly different from the final game. In the older version, the timepieces were not meant to be used as fuel, but rather as a means of fixing time itself by putting the pieces back together again. This is why there is such a big focus on time in the final game. They are mostly relics of an older time in the game's development. What the timepieces are really used for now is nothing more than a tool to manipulate time and fuel Hackett's spaceship. So, nothing much really. Many of the characters that were originally announced were eventually scrapped. These characters were quietly removed as the game's focus shifted on the other characters that were more developed and sort of more than just filler characters. Sorry Tim. Well, actually I'm not. Didn't really like you. <laughs> Anyways, back to the Kickstarter. Now by June 17th, the team updated their stretch goals, now including a new game plus, voice mumble option, as a homage to Banjo-Kazooie, and finally, a Hat Kid spaceship hub for $200,000. All very intriguing stretch goals that would add a lot to the game. A couple days later, the team showed their first prototype of the game to a group called Video Games Awesome. Now this prototype had a vastly different art style and overall feel from the final game. But the basis of it is still there. You could look at this footage and say, oh yeah, that looks like a hat in time. Though I don't remember that being there. Or, or that. What? When was that in the game? They also showed off this prototype to Joss Jepsen, who also made a video showcasing the first area of the game. The prototype must have gotten even more people interested in the project, because the next day they reached the Grant Kirkhope song goal. Years for Breakfast was now only 50 grand away from reaching every stretch goal, and they had one week to do so. I wonder if they'll be able to make all the stretch goals in time. Oh, they reached them all already? We still have three days left at the Kickstarter, what do we do now? Grant's Musical Madness. Grant Kirkhope, like the madman he is, 
decided that for every $15,000 over $200,000, he would make a new song for the game. This led to him making six more songs before the Kickstarter ended. In the end, on June 28th of 2013, over 9,000 backers made $296,360. The team was overwhelmed by the absolutely immense amount of donations that had come through for their cause. Even from day one, they never expected to make much especially seeing that their original goal was only 30k. At the time, every team member shared a little thank you message to the people who made the game possible. Here's my favorite. I for one can say that originally when we reached the 30,000 goal, I was blown away. I mean, I was planning on stealing all of that money for myself, making a beeline to Mexico under the alias of Alejandro Martinez to live out my days as a rich and powerful hermit. Now though, You've all realized I can reach for the stars with bigger plans. I'm, I'm going, going to, to rule, rule the world with your money and create an army of- now, During the same time, Gears for Breakfast is working hard on getting a hand time greenlit on Steam. Which was a process that game developers had to go through to get their games on Steam up until June 6th of 2017. This meant that game developers needed enough votes and positive feedback from fans to be put on the Steam store page. Now, Hat in Time was number 23 on Steam Greenlight at the time, which just went to show how much their fans loved the game. Seeing as it had such an overwhelmingly positive response, it's no surprise that the game was greenlit just about a month later. Now, a few days prior to this, the team makes a big announcement. They added a slacker backer option via the Humble Bumble store, with the promise that they will receive the game earlier than its worldwide release and be able to play in the alpha and betas. They also announced Chapter 3 a couple days later. Now many of you may know Chapter 3 as a Subcon Forest, but back in these days, Subcon Forest and Battle of the Birds were actually switched around. Also, Battle of the Birds is quite a bit different than what you may remember. At this point, Battle of the Birds is only half of what it was in the final game. That is to say, the penguins do not exist. The chapter is currently called Trainwreck of Science and features a train of science owls that eventually travel to the moon. As you can see with this chapter, and what will be a bit of a theme for the whole of the game's development, the key elements of the chapter are there, but it's missing a lot and going in a completely different direction from a plot standpoint. While we're on the topic though, we should mention that Subcon Forest was quite different as well. Here is what Jonas Karlov originally said about the chapter. Forest is a no man's land, and as a result we have forces fighting to take control of it all. The moon jumper. A mysterious and fine gentleman invites you to the forest, a place he considers soon to be his domain. The Snatcher, a sneaky sado who grants people and their belongings to hide them where they are never to be found. And Queen Vanessa, the less said about the queen the better. Just beware of those cute little eyes of hers. The forest isn't a place for ordinary people, instead it's populated by the forest dwellers, flying gooey spirits who hide behind various masks. They claim to once have been living creatures. Ha! <laughs> says the Moonjumper. Clearly they are just pretending. As you can guess, that wasn't quite the same as the final game, but it does give us this absolutely hilarious piece of concept art. Well now, well now, well now, kid, I love this hat. But it is plain, far too plain. Pink peppermint is what you need. Pink peppermint is yum. Shame they didn't put that in the final game because it adds so much depth to the character that would have made Snatcher so much more interesting. Instead of this sad divorce ghost we get in the final game. It's okay, Snatcher. I think Pink Peppermint is yum. Now before we move on, let's take a pause real quick. We have talked all about the game and its development so far, but there is one key detail that we have yet to talk about. The team behind it. I feel it is only fair that we say a word or two about them and where they come from. Gears for Breakfast is made up of 8 people from across the world, and as such, many members have never even met anyone on the team in person. And while we don't have enough time to talk about each of them individually, even though I would like to, something that is important to note is that many of them used to be mod developers prior to working on this game. That is important because it actually leads to our next major update for the team. Transition! <laughs> on December 14th of 2013, they announced Steam Workshop support for a hat in time. Steam Workshop is essentially creator-supported mods. It's a place for modders to upload their own custom creations and add-ons to their favorite games. 
this means community-generated content is easily accessible and even supported by the developers. Which is something I can't say about other big publishers. <coughs> Nintendo. Corporate greed aside, a hand time is now getting ready to release an alpha for February 20th of 2014. The next big thing for Hat in Time was being invited to PAX East 2014. From the footage I found, courtesy of Third Rate Minion, it looks like the main thing being shown off here was Queen Vanessa's Manor with co-op gameplay. From interviews, it appears that the team was working on World Free by the time of the event, having just started work on what would have been the final act of the world where the train goes to the moon. Obviously, this was changed after the fact. The Alpha I mentioned earlier focused more on Mafia Town, which surprisingly seems to be the one area that changed the least from the beginning to the end of the game's development. Besides these two events, there isn't much in terms of updates for Hat and Time. Well, there is, but not that I can access. I didn't back the project as much as I wish I did, so there are some posts that I cannot see. A beta was announced at some point for March 7th of 2015, but other than that, I am completely clueless to what happened during this time. With that, I suppose the next thing to note is their first playtest. The team announced on June 22nd that they had done some playtesting for the game, and were astonished by how big their game had become. Most playtests would last around 6 hours, stretching long into the night. Many of them had to end sort due to it getting so late, typically going until midnight. The playtesters all had a great time and grabbed on average 20 timepieces. Even with playing for such a long time, they still feel like they had so much to do. With that successful playtest, the team pushed forward and gave us a sneak peek of Chapter 4, Sand and Sails. Yes, Sand and Sails. What, haven't heard of it? Did you even play the game? Well, I suppose it was called Alpine Skylines by the final game and looks very different, but still, fake fan. Can't believe you don't even know what Sand and Sails is. What's the chapter about, you ask? Well... Okay, so this is like all they showed of the chapter until they change it to Alpine Skyline, so I have no idea. What do you mean, hypocrite? You're a hypocrite. Okay, that's enough from you now. If you would just hold still. <laughs> Shut up, this would be a lot easier if you held still. There. Now that's better. Oh shoot, I'm still recording. On December 18th of 2015, the team had one of their first major updates in a while. This is when the team announced the Scooter Badge, Time Rifts, and so much more. This is also the first time we get an in-depth look at the new format for the second chapter. They now have the entirety of Subcon Forest all figured out, the contractual obligations, Snatcher's story, and to top it all off, no more Moon Jumper, making the story much more like what it was in the final game. With that, we jump ahead a couple months to March of 2016 when they announced some of the music that would be shown off in the game. Most of this is from Pascal Michael Stiefel, the game's lead composer. However, they also saw off a remix from Kumu, who is one of the game's guest composers. These guest composers make special remixes, which you get from the slot machine in the main hub. Now with that out of the way, it's about time that Gears for Breakfast finally gives us a release date for the game. 2017. But that's fine, I mean, the game's only been in development for... Four years. Oh my gosh, has it been that long? At this point, the game is mostly completed as what you can see from this neat little chart here. Also, Trainwreck of Science is looking a lot more like what it was in the final game, although the name needs some more consideration. And Tim the CEO of Time has been demoted to just another hat kid, which isn't quite the same co-op campaign we got in the final game, but it's a step in the right direction. Along with that, Kickstarter goods are beginning production. As the team enters 2017, they get invited to another PAX event, PAX 2017, where they attend a special live stream where yet another demo of the first area is sewn off. Soon after, they announce big changes to their fourth chapter, it is now called Alpine Skylines, and actually resembles what we play through in the final game quite well. The game is also soon announced for release in fall of 2017, making the release just a bit sooner. They also showed this fantastic trailer for the Murder on the Al Express mission, which is honestly one of the best trailers for a game I've ever seen. It soon announced that the team will be taking Murder on the Al Express with them as a playable demo to E3. With that, they announced the game for Xbox and PlayStation. This was largely thanks to Humble and Hardshoot Labs, which helped Gears for Breakfast port their game to consoles. Humble doing the publishing and Hardshoot doing the actual porting. However, this update didn't come without downsides. 
Co-op wasn't going to be released day one anymore, and would instead be included in the game's first free DLC. This is also around the time when they stopped allowing people to come slacker backers. This meant no more perks for joining early in the game's development anymore. Before we move on, we need to realize just how important this console release was in the game's development. Since the beginning of the Kickstarter, people have always wanted a console release as a stretch goal. However, Jonas Karlov has stated time and time again that although he was trying to make it possible, it was very difficult, as the game was made using Unreal Engine 3. This would require them to obtain an Unreal Engine license to port the game, which was known to cost around $500,000. Getting a publisher with an Unreal Engine license to let them use their license for a portion of the profit. On top of this all, Jonas was the only programmer for the team for a large portion of the game's development. So a console release just seemed unlikely for the time. Having a console release finally be announced was just a big step from where they were when they started the Kickstarter. Although, most of the early backers wanted a Wii U port. That would have to wait much longer. The game is now set to release on PC for October 5th, with Xbox One and PS4 releases later delayed to be a bit further back. Along with this, the team also talked more about the modding support they would provide for a game, allowing you to easily make new hats, enemies, chapters, and so much more. And just when you thought it couldn't get any better, they announced official mods. These would be made by indie teams from many different backgrounds to add something from their own respective games and franchises into a hat in time. Some great games are featured here, such as Psychonauts 2, Freedom Planet 2, One Shot, Shovel Knight, and much more. With that, the game was set for a fantastic launch. On October 3rd, two days before launch, the game had already received an 8.5 out of 10 on Destructoid. It's setting the tone for the rest of the game's history, as Chris Carter stated that, A hat in time caught my eye the moment I saw the pitch. There's so much character in nearly every pore of a hat in time. I'm amazed at how polished it is, especially compared to some of its competitors. It seems that this is a sentiment shared by an outstanding 3,000 people, giving the game an overwhelmingly positive review on Steam in just two months after release. The game was amazing, it had such lovable characters, such diverse and interesting chapters and stories, such incredible art style, and so much more. I could go on and on, but this isn't a game review, it's a documentary that nobody asked for. Oh my gosh, he's dead the title, that's the ti- I thought I told you to stay quiet. Do we need to come down there? No? Good. On December 6th, the game was released on Xbox and PlayStation, which was also well received. So now the team was done with the base game, and all they had left to do was get the physical rewards in order and release the DLC they had promised during the Kickstarter. First of these free updates that the game was to publish was the modding update on March 13th, 2018. This update brought modding support out of beta and added a lot of cool features to go along with it. Whenever you played through a mod, you would receive a Rift token that you could use to purchase more cosmetics, adding an incentive to play through mods. Along with this, they added two mods into the base game. These mods included a German fan translation and dyeable hats. These mods were added to what would become the list of official mods, which are essentially just mods that were so cool, the team had to put them in the final game. Along with these two mods, many other mods would be added into the game as official mods at a later date. There are many courses in the Seal the Deal DLC that add some of these mods as well. The team has always had a close relationship with the modding community, and so it's cool to see them give the modding community more opportunities to be a part of the game's development. It's something that I've never seen from a game before. It's far too common for a game to leave the modding communities in the dust, or even flat out take down their projects that they've worked so hard for. <coughs> Nintendo. <laughs> the next big update for Gears for Breakfast is the Seal the Deal DLC including a brand new chapter of the Arctic Cruise, along with a new game mode, Death Wish, as well as split screen co-op and a Nintendo Switch port. It released on September 13th of 2018, and it was completely free for the first 24 hours of release, with a Nintendo Switch port coming later on October 18th of 2019. After this DLC, the Niakuna Metro was announced. It would release on May 10th of 2019 for PC, and include a new open world area, 10 new timepieces to collect, tons of customization options, online parties, and so much more. Now, this DLC was released on November 21st for Nintendo Switch owners, but for Xbox and PlayStation users, 
The DLC would not be released until March 31st of 2021. Alas, it seems we've about reached the end of the story for a hand time. The last update was the Crater DLC. Essentially, Gears for Breakfast will partner with the Hat and Time modders and help them make their vision become reality. Currently, there is only one Crater DLC available, Vanessa's Curse, which is an online multiplayer mode where players must play a twisted version of Tag within the halls of Vanessa's Manor. With supposedly many more Crater DLC to come, the game looks like it still has a lot more life left in it. So with that, we can finally end the- We can finally- We can- We can-, we can, we can So with that, we can finally end the video. I'd like to give a quick thank you to the Wayback Machine. Without them, I wouldn't have been able to find half the info I did. Sources are in the description, along with any videos I've used, so you can check that out. With that, see you guys next time for another documentary none of you asked for.